Thanks so much, and uh, I'm Drew Meneker from Penn America. Um, first, I wanted to thank the Brooklyn Library for making this What's event. Your name again? What's your name? Drew Meneker. Um, so I just want to take a moment to, first of all, to thank the Brooklyn Library for helping us make this evening possible. And uh, I just take a moment to introduce Penn America. Uh, we're a writer-powered <coughs> organization with a membership of more than 4,300 writers and their allies. Uh, some of you may know us from our Penn World Voices Literary Festival each spring, or perhaps for our literary awards, or for our events with writers and their readers. Uh, I hope some of you may also know about us from the global advocacy that we do on free expression issues here and in, here in the United States and internationally. Uh, this visit of this uh, delegation of Russian writers, um, of which tonight's program is part, uh, is at the very heart of Penn's mission. And um, we seek to recognize and to uh, admire the contributions of writers of all kinds, novelists, poets, essayists, the full literary community, and to advance the free expression rights that make their work possible. And we do this uh, by bringing forward the case of, in, of imprisoned and imperiled writers around the world, um, by weighing in on advocacy issues with policymakers and political leaders, and by marshalling sort of the influential voices of our membership, our writers and supporters. Um, we also now regularly bring frontline voices uh, to the United States to draw attention to these free expression issues, um, but to do it in their own words, and we think that's extremely important. Um, the writers that you're hearing from tonight will also be making many other public and private uh, appearances around New York and in Washington this week while they're here. I uh, also want to just briefly draw your attention to uh, our the latest in our series of substantive uh, um, research reports uh, that we do to accompany these visits. The, we've just done one on um, the, the, in conjunction with their uh, trip here. It's available on our website, pen.org, and it's called Discourse in Danger, Free uh, Attacks on Free Expression in Russia. Uh, and it looks at how the controls on the media and the public debate are now expanding into the cultural and creative spheres. And with that in mind, uh, it brings me great pleasure to introduce our uh, panel tonight. Uh, they cohabit uh, Russia's intellectual space, but from differing vantage points. Um, an acclaimed writer, a poet and website founder, a novelist and a journalist, and a publisher and writer. Um, so I'll start with Ludmila Ulitskaya, who probably needs no introduction to many of you, but is, an, of, of course, an honored writer in Russia and in, internationally, and of also a voice for open discourse and debate. Her 2012 novel, The Big Green Tent, that Ala mentioned, uh, chronicles dissent in, uh, a dissident life in post-war <coughs> Russia, and it was re recently released in the U.S. in English translation. Uh, Maria Stepanova is a poet uh, whose work is widely honored and, and widely translated. Um, she's also the founder and editor of one of the few remaining independent information sources in Russia, the website Kulta.ru, uh, which covers uh, cultural, political, social issues um, in today's Russia. We also have with us Anna Nemzer, who is a novelist and a journalist. Her first novel, Captivity in English, was published in Russia in 2013, and I understand there's an English translation coming uh, this year. She's also a producer for TV Rain, uh, another of the dwindling number of independent news sources persevering under tremendous pressure. Uh, and finally, we have Ilya Danishevsky, who is a publisher as well as a writer. Um, he's the chief editor of Remina, uh, an imprint of a large publishing house that has managed to bring forward uh, the work of writers who are, are um, creating outside the official state-sanctioned discourse. And finally, we're uh, so pleased to have Boris Kachka from New York Magazine to do the honors of moderating this conversation tonight. Uh, Boris is a cultural journalist who's interviewed and written about hundreds of intriguing people, um, and he's also the author of Hot House, which is a look inside the publishing industry. So with that, I'll just turn over to, now to Boris and our guests. Thank you. 
Hello, everyone. I'm so happy to be here and so happy to have these uh, wonderful and distinguished people here. Um, you know, I think um, the understanding that, um, you know, I have, I came over here when I was very young, and the model that I have for censorship of um, cultural products in Russia is this very direct top down, uh, you know, if we don't want it published, it won't be published. And the only way that you could read it was from some fifth generation Xerox, <laughs> Xerox copy, Samizdat. And uh, there was no uh, culture except for an unofficial culture, really. Um, I think that the model is very different now. And to make a direct comparison and, and, and just say that Putin is the Soviet Union 2.0 uh, would be inaccurate. And, as, and I think it especially is that way when it comes to writing. Um, and uh, so my first question would be, I think, to Ludmila, uh, with everybody else chiming in if they'd like, but um, you have been writing for a long time. Uh, you obviously uh, lived through the era of Samizdat and, and, and suffered under the regime, um, and you experienced the openness of the 90s and now this, uh, this closing that we're talking about here. So I wonder if you can speak a little bit about that difference. How does it feel different now uh, the hand of the state on the cultural production than it did in the uh, 50s, 60s, 70s? Oh, one of the uh, particulars of my uh, biography, a writer's biography, I've never been an official Soviet writer. My first book was published in 1994 in Russia. И поэтому некоторый опыт писательский, который так хорошо известен моим сверстникам, профессиональным писателям советского времени, он мне не знаком. And uh, this particular experience that is so well known to my contemporaries, to uh, my peers, uh, is not really known to me. Более того, печататься я начала в совершенно уникальные для России годы, когда цензура впервые за, по-моему, существование России как государство, я не имею в виду Советскую Россию, была ну, закончена. I started publishing at the time uh, when censorship uh, for the first time in the history of Russia, and I don't just mean the Soviet Russia, but for the first time ever, uh, was uh, literally over. There was no central censorship committee anymore. Художественно такой процесс в художественной литературе он последние 25 лет происходил практически без цензуры. And uh, uh, the process of um, uh, writing and publishing fiction, uh, the discourse in, in fiction happened practically without state interference. Это не значит, что завтра это не закончится, но пока что художественную литературу практически не цензурируют. It doesn't mean that it's not going to be finished tomorrow, but uh, today uh, fiction is not being censored. Однако в области массовой информации картина совершенно не такая, потому что давление цензурное, которое не называется цензурным, оно как-то иначе называется, но тем не менее оно очень мощное, и сегодня независимые средства массовой информации постепенно прекращают свое существование одно за другим, и остался совсем небольшой островок независимой печати, и даже я бы не столько печати, сколько независимой сети, потому что в основном свободное слово существует сегодня в этой небольшой зоне. Ну, разумеется, я повторяю, что это имеет отношение не к художественной литературе, а исключительно к средствам к массовой информации. So the picture is, however, very different in mass media, and today uh, we see a very heavy pressure uh, from censorship or whatever we can call that pressure that is exerted on mass media, and there are very few uh, voices uh, that are left. There is a very limited island, if you will, of voices, and primarily not so much in publishing, but rather on the internet. And it uh, continues to be pressured and is dwindling. But again, uh, uh, let me repeat that the situation is different between mass media and fiction. Даже книги такого острова, 
и автора, как Владимир Сорокин, продолжают печататься, продолжают продаваться в магазинах. И, в общем, пока что мы живем в этой, на этом свободном островке. Even such uh, a, an author, um, uh, who we can call a, a very controversial author, perhaps as Vladimir Sarokin, uh, controversial is not exact word, a very um, hot, a very uh, contentious author, uh, he still is continuing to being published uh, without real issues. Uh, well, the, um, the non-fiction area maybe is a little bit uh, different. There's overlap with journalism. And, um, and so maybe, Ilya, by way of introducing yourself, you can tell us a little bit about the, uh, the imprint that you publish, um, <clears throat> why there's a series called Anhedonia, which um, I think means a lack of pleasure or a uh, failure to experience pleasure, not something we usually uh, associate with uh, books. Uh, and and uh, what uh, obstacles you've encountered to uh, to publishing work, and and just very briefly how how that works, how how uh, you've been prevented from publishing certain books or acquiring certain books. Ну вот начнем с того, что название Ангидония как раз больше подходит тому, что происходит в современной России, чем слово цензура. So the name Angedonia perhaps um, is, uh, describes uh, much more accurately than censorship of what is happening in Russia today. And since this word maybe raises some issues, is not familiar, let me explain. Это один из сопутствующих синдромов клинической депрессии, при котором а, организм перестает испытывать удовольствие. Um, And what it means that uh, a human body stops experiencing pleasure. И примерно так можно этим же этим словом можно назвать происходящее с российской политикой и с российской культурой. And perhaps this word can also be used to describe what's happening with Russian culture and with Russian politics. То есть мы говорим о неком очень узком поле, неком гетто, где 90% участников этого гетто, которые пытаются отстоять свои границы, знакомы друг с другом. So we're talking a very a small limited uh, field, perhaps even a ghetto, where uh, people are trying to fight for their positions and 90% of the people know each other. Или познакомиться завтра. Or maybe we'll meet each other tomorrow. И в таких обстоятельствах мы понимаем, что книги в отличие от uh, масс-медиа, все еще находится под радаром, потому что это настолько узкое поле, что оно не может быть интересным государству. Мы имеем очень маленькое количество прецедентов, когда государство указало на какие-то книжки с желанием что-либо с ними сделать. And we have very few examples where the government um, uh, singled out um, some books and wanted to do something about those books. Uh, and in my experience, this was the autobiography of a um, musical group for men, or a political, political group for men. Uh, и книги, исследовавшие коррупцию на Олимпиаде. And also books um, that Sochi. investigated uh, the corruption uh, of Olympic Games in Sochi. Uh, в остальном же мы видим, что этот рынок достаточно свободный и ограничен исключительно коммерческими вещами. And uh, as to the rest, we see that this market is still relatively free and is limited by primarily commercial things. Uh, недавно вышла совершенно прекрасная Uh, книга диалогов Навального и польского политолога Михника. Которая, как мне кажется, должна была быть интересна, ну просто интересна, uh, огромному количеству людей. Which I thought would be uh, very interesting to a great number of people. Uh, Но ну, насколько я знаю, тираж был около 500 штук. But I think that uh, maybe um, only about a thousand copies were printed. Книги лежат в центральных магазинах Москвы. And uh, the books are uh, lying about in central book uh, shops in Moscow. И это никому не интересно. And it's not interesting to anyone. Я думаю, что в современной России 
люди не хотят задуматься о том, что с ними происходит, и не хотят искать прецеденты, которые могут принудить их к этим мыслям. And um, I think that in today's Russia, in modern Russia, people do not really want to uh, understand what's happening with them and do not want to look for precedents or for examples that might explain uh, some of the processes. И я думаю, путинский аппарат, который следит за книжками, ну наверняка они их все-таки читают, понимает, что все это не имеет никакого значения. And I think that the, the government, um, the apparatus that I think still does read the books, they do understand that uh, in principle it doesn't really matter. Эти книги доставляются ровно тем, кому они должны доставиться, кто уже и так стигматизирован для политики. The books are received and are given to people who are already stigmatized for politics. И мы говорим о создании некой политической, оппозиционной субкультуры. And we are talking about, about here about the creation of a certain political subculture. В которую не входят, то есть не массовые СМИ, которые занимают независимые позиции, не книжный рынок, не могут достучаться до новых людей. And that does not include the independent mass media, it does not include the book market who cannot really get through to the new people, to the new generations. Um, well, I, I, I do want to, though, address the, that there was a pen report that was just released um, that documented the ways that, uh, you know, there are certain ill-defined uh, laws uh, that uh, prohibit, for example, uh, writing about, for a certain age group, about suicide, about homosexuality. Uh, there are, of course, broad laws against, uh, you know, uh, being... Uh, a, a terrorist, which could be broadly defined as any anybody criticizing the government, and that the way it works with publishing is that it's a, it has a chilling effect on bookstores. The lawyers within the publishing houses will not take a chance and publish certain books. Uh, so whether or not this impacts, for example, literary fiction at this point, I wonder if all of you, any of you, can tell me whether you think this is the beginning of something that actually will begin to have an impact on literary culture in a more direct way in the future. Uh, Maria, do you want to chime in? Anna? Uh, well, uh, maybe uh, let me refocus a little. Uh, um, uh, uh, well, uh, our boundaries, uh, our, uh, um, our thoughts about censorship uh, has its boundaries and they're much more transparent and much larger than we used to think about it. Uh, let me just give one example. I'm working on TV Rain, one of the um, one of the independent Russian TV channels. And two years ago, there was a story when they published. Uh, I didn't work there uh, then. They published a, a social poll uh, about the siege of Leningrad, and one of the questions uh, was considered to be an insult to all uh, who overwhelmed uh, the siege. Uh, what happens then? Uh, it's not uh, the censorship as such. It's something, it, it's something, um, uh, some other thing. Uh, immediately, uh, all cable operators uh, just turn the TV rain off. Uh, the, all the advertisement disappears immediately because nobody wants to deal with TV rain. The landlords just refuse to renew the rental contract and so the TV channel has to move to the underground studio and uh, it never stopped broadcasting. Is that the case of uh, censorship? Not actually, but it's how it works in our new reality. Uh, one of the projects that I think you both worked on together was something called the Museum of the 90s that I wanted to know a little bit more about. Because it wasn't, I mean, it's not a literal museum, it's, it was online. And I, uh, I wanted to find out a little bit about the goal of documenting the 90s, what the 90s means in Russian culture. Obviously, it was a more open period. Uh, Maria, I think you uh, you were very directly involved with that. Do you want to just explain what it was about? Uh, well, uh, the uh, 1990s is one of the most interesting periods in contemporary Russian history. And I would even say 
uh, in the Russian history of the past uh, 60 or 70 years. Because for the first time, uh, the uh, state and the nation and the people were allowed to do whatever they want to do. I mean, the censorship uh, in any, on any level was uh, demolished. Uh, and uh, this opportunity of freedom uh, was uh, a huge chance that the country could use, and it didn't. Uh, but all the same, uh, it was uh, a complicated period, and uh, every one of us has uh, a range of memories on this time, and uh, those memories are not necessarily pleasant, but they are nevertheless intense. It was the time of different beginnings, uh, not only in political life, but also in culture. And it was uh, a time of monumental failures, and those are also something to remember. That's why we are interested in the 90s as a kind of a grand example, something to think about, uh, because if Russia will ever get a second chance, uh, it, will, uh, it will necessarily go back to that experience of the 90s. And uh, uh, to add a few words, uh, we at Kolta were hosting a huge literary festival in Moscow uh, last September. It was uh, totally dedicated to the 90s. It was called the Island of the 90s. Uh, it was quite successful with 40,000 of uh, visitors. But uh, what was uh, absolutely amazing was something that preceded it. Uh, we wanted to tell our audience about the, the festival and its existence. And we started a kind of a flash mob, provoking our uh, readers to uh, put into the social networks their photographs from the 90s. And what uh, happened was uh, the biggest uh, flash mob that ever existed in the Russian internet. And it was an absolutely new and, uh, I would say, unexpected experience for me. I was hoping for a reaction, but not, but not such a reaction. People were pasting their photographs uh, of newborn babies uh, circa 1992 of uh, aged parents, of youngsters in, uh, in uh, crazy, ragged clothes of the 90s. And, you know, people are usually uh, speaking about Russia, dividing it into different social, uh, socially uh, oriented groups. Uh, those who were voting for Putin and against Putin, 14% uh, and 86%. Uh, the uh, educated uh, minority and the not so much educated majority. But I can say that people involved in that flash mob were everyone. It was just the population that, had, that wanted to say something about, that wanted to share their memories, that wanted to add something about some experience they all had in common. And, well, uh, it was a, a lifetime experience. Uh, uh, we called our project the Museum of 90s, and uh, it's an, uh, it, uh, it is based on, thanks to Masha, uh, culture.ru uh, culture and on snob.ru, uh, and now we're going to publish it as a book. And what I'm talking about it's, uh, is that it's very important for me and for my colleagues to call it museum because it's no way that um, any offline museum of 90s could appear uh, in Russia now because it's the most uh, um, this uh, decade, uh, well we are conquering for this decade because all our history is uh, full of blind spots and one of them is 90s our 90s, um, and our authorities say that it was a time of um, darkness and, um, and sadness, and we say that, we say that 
It was the time of uh, unbelievable freedom in all its senses. And what's, uh, well, usually uh, a museum appears at that moment when, a historical museum appears at that moment when we have something like uh, agreement about this period or at least uh, a large uh, public discussion. And what we are doing, calling this project museum, we are trying, and maybe it's a game, but we are trying to, uh, to start this discussion. And that flash mob, uh, which uh, preceded um, uh, the, the festival, uh, it was also this part of this discussion, which is, I think, very important. Uh, Ludmila, you, um, I wonder what it was like to be, uh, to be experiencing the 90s from your point of view, uh, having been an unpublished writer and then very quickly becoming very well known, rightly so, and then having to see things begin to close down a little bit, uh, even if it doesn't directly affect you, although uh, you... Um, you have been outspoken about um, opposing the changes in the government. Um, what was it like to go through that openness and then see it close again? Was it, um, uh, did, I mean, did it make you despair for the future? Did it make you think, oh well, <laughs> there it goes? Um, tell me what went through your mind. Вы знаете, в 90-е годы, во всяком случае, в 90-м, когда все мои друзья вышли на площадь и э, знали, чего делали, в это время я сидела дома и очень нервничала, потому что мне хотелось быть вместе с моими друзьями, но что-то меня дома держало. И я это сформулировала тогда таким образом. Я сказала, э, ну, мне не нравится Ельцин, мне не нравится то, что он из партийных... Э, функционеров. Вот когда будет иллюстрация, тогда я, ребята, буду с вами. Tried to justify it by saying I don't like Yeltsin. He is one of those party people. He is from the same uh, um, um, organization, from the same ilk, and I wait until there is illustration of some sort. И несмотря на то, что явно совершенно это было замечательное событие и конец советской власти, о котором просто даже мечтать не могли и не предполагали, что такое на нашем веку может случиться. Uh, and even though that was even a remarkable and uh, by all accounts a remarkable event, it was the end of the Soviet power and it was a, an event we couldn't have even dreamed about. And of course it was a remarkable time. Но я думаю, что у меня оно очень недолго продержалось, потому что иллюстрации не произошло, и все дальнейшее дальнейший ход событий все-таки привел к тому, что страна оказалась сдана в руки КГБ, а это самая э, кошмарная организация, которая только была в нашей стране, и таким образом самые мои плохие прогнозы реализовались. And my worst predictions came true. И надо сказать, что жила я 90-е годы как-то не в ногу со своей страной, потому что это было время, когда я начинал писать большие, свои большие книги, Медею, роман Медея, ее дети, еще какие-то большие книги. И поэтому я как-то вся была сосредоточена на этом. Болел, умирал мой отец, какие-то были довольно тяжелая жизнь. И социальные uh, процессы я не очень ими была, не очень была вовлечена. And uh, uh, to be frank, I was a bit out of sync with my country in the 90s because this was a time uh, when I was working on my big books. I, I published uh, the no a novel Medea and Her Children. My father uh, was getting sick and was dying, and life was uh, very difficult, was very hard. So I wouldn't say that I was very involved in the social dynamics of the 90s. 
И поэтому, когда я открыла глаза и посмотрела по сторонам, то я увидела, что то, что происходит на улице, довольно сильно отличается от того, что было в советские времена, но на самом деле никакой радости не произошло. And then I opened my eyes and looked at what was happening out in the street. I did see that it is quite different than what was happening during the Soviet times, but it didn't really deliver great pleasure. Great, great joy. Um, I wonder. There's this, um, you know, and we did, we haven't spoken a, a, too much about call to R U, but um, you know, there was this idea, especially uh, with the Arab Spring, that because of the internet, uh, revolution would be uh, online and and uh, easy as pie, and um, that obviously didn't happen there. And I don't. I want, but I wonder if you think that there are some ways. Like for example, I did hear that e-books are maybe a way around um, a fear to, uh, or the reluctance of bookstores to publish certain kinds of books. So that's an example of the promise of technology to make information easier to disseminate. But is, the, is it the case that there is any, that it's any harder to shut down something like Colta RU than it is a television station? Is it a refuge in any way from uh, control? Uh, well, uh, you know, there are uh, ways and ways of shutting down uh, things, uh, TV channels, magazines, uh, websites. And uh, it is not necessarily done by direct uh, and plain censorship. There are ways and ways. Uh, there is always the economical framework, and uh, it is uh, maybe especially serious for Colta.ru uh, because uh, what we are doing is a big experiment. We are the first and only site uh, in uh, contemporary Russia that is totally crowdfunded. I mean, we don't have owners or uh, shareholders. We have our editorial board and uh, people who are willing to donate, to invest, to invest in the future of uh, one of the few uh, independent websites still alive. But now in the framework of economical crisis, of course, uh, getting donors, getting donations is mm, becoming more and more uh, dangerous. Uh, no, 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 uh, dangerous and uh, also hard to do. Dangerous when it comes to uh, receiving donations from uh, from abroad because there is this law uh, about foreign agents uh, that uh, automatically can make uh, uh, you uh, guilty, uh, make you a foreign agent, uh, 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 thus leading you to some unknown but serious consequences, uh, simply because someone uh, have given you a $10 bill for your website. Uh, it doesn't mean uh, there is no difference uh, if it is a, um, a person or a, uh, an NGO or some foundation. Uh, it is all the same. And uh, due to the crisis, uh, people uh, all over Russia are, uh, it is harder to them uh, to share uh, uh, the spare money they have with uh, someone else. And of course, no one wants to, to, to take part in the kind of a crowdfunding race where you know, a few, one, two, three, four independent websites are you know, raising a big crowdfunding campaign and uh, people have to decide uh, who is the best one uh, who we are helping uh, in this month. It is, uh, it is uh, complicated and it raises uh, a lot of moral issues. Uh, but uh, the thing that is uh, even more serious for me uh, is uh, the phenomenon that was called in the Soviet times an inner editor. It is an uh, entity uh, that you are finding, locating deep inside of yourself. And when you are to publish something risky, you are asking yourself, Am I in the right position to do it? Will it do anything? Uh, you, you have to, to decide. Um, is it so urgent? Is it so important that I really am willing to risk 
uh, the salaries and maybe lives of my uh, editorial staff. Uh, because as you know, uh, there, uh, there is also an uh, anti-extremist law that uh, allows the government and Roskomnadzor, a special organization that is uh, to, to watch out for anything criminal, that is, so to say criminal, that is uh, getting written and published. Uh, and this Roskomnadzor is able to uh, shut down any publication without any reason, without explanation, just because uh, they are considering some article or some line uh, extremist. And uh, there is no uh, exact description of what extremist really is. And so you're keeping, uh, you keep asking yourself, is this or that is the right thing to do? And this uh, state of everlasting moral ambiguity uh, is something that is driving you crazy. I'll finish with a small story uh, that maybe illustrates my point better than I could uh, explain it uh, in more abstract details. Uh, a year and a half ago, when the uh, war at Ukraine was at its peak, uh, uh, Alek Kashin, a celebrated journalist, addressed uh, Kolta Ru, uh, asking us if uh, we would uh, publish a column that he had uh, just written, uh, and uh, that column was about the uh, huge burials that were going on in complete darkness. No one was writing or even knowing, or knowing about it at the Pskov's Oblast, uh, uh, around a uh, small city, uh, Pskov. And uh, it was, uh, so to say, the war burials. They were burying soldiers who were fighting at Ukraine, but no one was uh, willing to admit that Russian troops are at Ukraine. So it was complicated, and it was done in, uh, in complete secret. And uh, Alek Kashin uh, wrote a column describing the situation. Uh, and uh, Kolta was not the first uh, publication he addressed uh, with this column. We were the third. I know the, the, the names of uh, publications that refused to publish it. And of course, I'm not uh, ever uh, you know, the one to name it, because it's the challenge that we are facing every other time to publish or not? Is it, mm, is it urgent? Is it necessary? And you know that it's not a question that the journalist has to ask himself. The journalism is about publishing. And uh, so we, we were discussing it for half a night with my deputy editor uh, because I have to say we were afraid because cult exists without owners, and there is no one to protect us. Uh, we could be closed uh, on the n next morning. But, of course, we, <laughs> we decided to, you know, to hell with it, let's publish, and uh, let's just do it. And so we were the first. And then someone uh, put it into the uh, morning news, and then it was you know, all, over, uh, all, all over the internet. And uh, what is uh, amazing, nothing happened. No one, no, uh, no, not, not Colta nor any other publication were persecuted. Uh, the story just uh, became so huge that it was uh, impossible to not to notice it or to, 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 um, to, say it, to do something, uh, to, 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 to try to, to punish anyone because it was everywhere. And uh, I think that is how it works. You have always to continue struggling with this uh, inner editor because he is really the, the, the danger one has to face. And it is, he, it is more dangerous than, uh, than Putin. Well, that's a uh, sort of very optimistic answer to a question I was about to ask, but I'm going to ask it anyway. Um, it, there was a publisher who was quoted in one of the stories. Um, it was related to a children's book um, that ran afoul of the law for somehow implying that uh, the, that the Soviet Union had um, done bad things in Latvia, God forbid. 
Um, but he said, um, you know, we are all carriers of a Soviet mentality, which means we're infected with the virus of internal censorship. Um, that puts the blame on the people. Um, and it's, but it also says in a way, you know, we have nothing to lose but our chains, you know. So what is the answer here? Is this a Putin problem? Or is this a problem of a public, uh, uh, public mentality of some kind? I mean, I, and not just asking you, obviously, everybody. Um, please feel free to tell me what you think. I think that in book publishing, we really deal more with um, self-censorship I think that in book publishing, we really deal more with um, self-censorship, with inner censorship. And when I started, uh, those things that kind of were outside of the frontier, outside of the framework. And it all started with the story of Lenta um, Ru that uh, was uh, dismantled uh, specifically with uh, the government, with the powers in, um, under the uh, government's initiative. Я поясню, это был один and из лучших и наиболее нейтральных, неоценочных новостных сайтов России. Это было мое личное поражение, которое ломало мой распорядок дня. Мое утро начиналось с Лентеру, это был просто удар по мне. And uh, for me it was a personal hit because my every morning started with uh, Lenta, uh, .ru. That's how I uh, began my day. И мне просто пришлось лично разобраться в этой истории, что же такого там произошло и что с этим делать дальше. I wanted to look into this and and wanted to explain to myself what has happened there and what to do next. И мы сделали про это книжку, то есть где все работники лентеру рассказали эту историю. And we published a book where all the employees, all the people who worked at Lenta dot ru told their stories. Ну и далее эта история развернулась, то есть я стал брать одну за другой историю. And then uh, this kind of grew, and I uh, started gathering, started collecting other stories. Uh, каждый раз я думал, что может быть вот именно сейчас уже все за закроется. And uh, I, I thought every time that maybe this is it, uh, this is would be the end, and this would this story cl would close this issue. Но нет и нет, ничего не заканчивается до сих пор уже. But even today, out over two years after this episode, the stories keep coming. It it does not end. И когда я задаюсь вопросом, а почему же кроме меня, ну и кроме еще нескольких людей, которые занимаются книжным делом этими вопросами, почему же никто не занимается этим массово? Остается только один ответ, что это их личная цензура. And um, when I'm asking why other than myself and few other people, no one in book publishing is looking into those issues, the only plausible answer that it is uh, the inner censorship, the self-censorship. Я думаю, это также связано с тем, что влиять на книжный рынок несколько сложнее, чем на публикацию в конкретном сайте. And I think it is something also that affects uh, book publishing perhaps in a more complex way than it would affect a mass media market. Мы говорим о производстве конкретных физических артефактов, которые попадают в конкретные руки и далее могут передаваться и становятся, и если при условии запрета становятся чем-то... So, because we're talking about publishing books, and in the end, there are physical artifacts, there's something published, it's a thing that you can pass to another person, an object, and even if it is outlawed, if it's prohibited, then it becomes something like some is that, it still exists in physical form. Параллельной проблемой России является пиратство, потому что в России ничего не умеют покупать честно, а привыкли пировать. And another, uh, you know, another parallel problem here uh, is pirating, uh, because basically Basically, uh, Russians uh, do not want to buy a lot of intellectual property. Honestly, they are used to uh, freely taking it and stealing it. Мы наблюдаем, как государство пытается сражаться с трекерами, с сайтами, которые бесплатно распространяют книги, фильмы, музыку. And uh, we um, um, see how the government does try to do something about combating so so so-called tracker sites that uh, distribute free content, both books and and films. Но видим, и мы видим, что у них не получается. And we also see that they're not successful in combating those issues. И именно эта дыра которая при этом нарушает права 
наших же авторов становится прибежищем для их книг в случае их запрета. And uh, ironically, this hole that uh, violates uh, the copyrights of our authors becomes their protection in the case uh, that they are outlawed, that there is a prohibition on their work. Правительству нет возможности выкорчивать из интернета информацию. Government does not have an ability to really kind of take out for, uh, this information from the internet. Но если мы говорим о коммерческом рынке, мы говорим о том, что есть большое различие между советским временем и сейчас. But if we talk about commercial market, then there is a big difference between the Soviet times and what's happening now то было время более конкретизированной цензуры, конкретизированного давления, и люди повсеместно ощущали его, и, и сопротивлялись, или не сопротивлялись, но ощущали. And uh, the Soviet times were the times when there was concrete, exact censorship and pressure on everyone, and people chose to fight it or not to fight it. Сейчас же мы говорим о том, что есть огромное количество населения, я не думаю, что это те самые 86%, ну скажем, половина от этого числа, которое может, голосует за Путина, которое искренне не хочет получать свободу и не хочет получать uh, информацию. Today um, we um, can say that there is a significant number of people, maybe not the proverbial 86%, maybe half of those people voting for Putin who uh, sincerely do not want to receive information and do not want to have any freedom. И они выступают своего рода цензорами, когда они голосуют своим рублем. Uh, censorship, dictatorship. Uh, well, uh, I, I, I'm not so sure about it. Uh, I'll, uh, well, uh, my answer is a story. Um, uh, I was telling it today to my friends, uh, and I'll just retell it once more. Uh, it's a simple story about uh, uh, about a hairdresser, actually. Uh, the thing is, uh, well, uh, I'm a girl, and I wanted a new hairdo, and so I w went to my favorite hairdresser, and uh, I was sitting at the, the, uh, b b before the mirror, and uh, she was chatting, <coughs> as she always does. Uh, but usually it's about shapes, and about colors, and about uh, little technical things. Uh, but uh, here she wanted to speak about political stuff. And she was like, did you know anyone, uh, did, did you notice how everyone hates America? Uh, they are, you know, they, are the, they always want to monopolize everything. No one, no one wants to be friends with them anymore. And I was sitting, you know, keeping a straight face because I, uh, you know, I have, I have my views, but I don't want to lose my hairdresser. But, what happened actually is, I was keeping silent, but suddenly the uh, skissers stopped making sound, as if she understood something. And the next line was, and I was at the supermarket yesterday, and I didn't find my favorite brand of cheese. In fact, there was no uh, foreign cheese. I wonder what we are doing at Ukraine, it's so crazy. This uh, instant change of mind, I think, is something very meaningful. I mean, maybe some people are not so adamant in their views as it seems when they are doing their voting. Oh, okay, so uh, we're getting close to wrapping up, so I think I'll ask a silly question that each of you should answer. What, 10 years from now, what is going on with uh, writing, with culture? You don't have to say necessarily um, with the government, but what, what has happened? Has it, has it continued to close down? Um, are there any counter force, countervailing forces that make you optimistic, actually? So everybody, uh, starting with you. 
Но есть опасение, что великий писатель Владимир Сорокин дал на это ответ, и там есть этот прямой вопрос, и ответ будет ничего. Well, uh, my my notion is that uh, okay. My notion is that uh, the most important thing uh, for shaping the future, for what is going to happen in ten years' time or twenty years' time, is to maintain the ability to finally part with past. I'm. Uh, I have this feeling that what is happening in uh, Russia today can, can be explained only in terms of past and in terms of being obsessed with the past. And uh, to finish with it, with this obsession, uh, means to start with a new Russia, with a new future. And it is always uh, frightful to look into the future. The, uh, that's why no one wants to do it, and not only in Russia. I mean, look at the Hollywood. Uh, there is no movie about the nearest or distant future that is not an anti-utopia. But in Russia, it is even more powerful. So I cannot make prognosis. I'm, uh, I have a different profession. I can only wish. And what I wish for Russia is uh, to start all over Uh, to part with its past and to not maybe to want a new future, but to make yourself want to want a new future. Well, um, I'm absolutely not. Uh, I'm not a historical optimist. I'm more uh, historical hypochondric. Uh, and but uh, well, to be a Guinea pig uh, sometimes has its advantages. We all are a part of an experiment, but we have enough uh, reflection to to observe it, to describe it, to think about it, and um, well, actually. Uh, the totalitarian uh, regime or field always gives birth to an uh, alternative field uh, and we all are working in it well and maybe these are good news okay i think we're ready to move on to questions uh we've gathered them from the audience and uh but i guess i'll be doing the reading of the questions so thank you for them Um, I'm pretty good at reading. Uh, uh, first of all, I mean, the, it's a very simple one. Is is there an English version of uh, your website, which I assume means Colta are you? There is not. Well, uh, no, because we are uh, not in the best financial uh, situation right now. But uh, for me, it is one of the closest... Uh, Uh, points in my to-do list. I absolutely, uh, uh, I totally think that the English version is necessary. Uh, so, um, uh, you know, the freedom that uh, that came back um, in the 90s um, and that is uh, still there today to some extent, is, is, is it better to, uh, well, Is there is the market pressure the biggest problem right now? I guess is is the question. What what is actually better for creativity, political pressure or market pressure, or what is worse for creativity? I guess. Anybody have an answer? Я думаю, что помимо рыночного и политического давления существует третий вид давления, который может быть самым страшным. I think that apart from uh, political pressure and market pressure, there is another uh, uh, third way, uh, third uh, uh, type of pressure that perhaps is most scary. Это то негласное разрешение правительства, которое дает правительству той части населения, которая поддерживает его право на насилие. It perhaps <coughs> is this kind of an um, uh, official permission that the government does uh, to the part of population that supports it to have a right uh, to uh, exert violence, to commit violence. У меня есть достаточно старый пример, который я много раз апеллировал к нему в России, когда просто представлял, что условная Марина Абрамович повторяет 
перформанс, балканская барокко в России против войны на Украине. And I, I uh, am using this example. I used it quite a lot in the past, but I think it's appropriate. Uh, for example, let's imagine um, a Marina Abramovich uh, to uh, conduct a, a performance uh, piece. Uh, uh, Balkan Barocco uh, to protest the war in Ukraine and that she uh, conducts this in Russia. И я представляю, что могли бы сделать люди, которые увидели бы это. I can imagine what people uh, who would see that, what would they do? Их гнев мог бы физически обрушиться на такого художника. And their anger uh, could be uh, quite physically uh, 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 be directed to this artist. И когда правительство получило бы вопрос, почему данный художник погиб, оно просто видело, так получилось. And if um, somebody would ask the government how did it happen that this artist died, the government would shrug and say, well, it happened this way. Um, Donald Trump. <laughs> Donald Trump has voiced his political worship of Putin. Uh, uh, you're not asking anyone to endorse uh, any of the candidates for president, but do you have any view regarding uh, their sensitivity to the human rights issues in Russia? Is it an important? Uh, are you watching the campaign? Is it an important issue for you? Anybody? Because he praised Putin. Yeah. Anybody want to talk about Donald Trump's praise of Putin? Well, uh, we have a Russian version of Donald Trump. It is Vladimir Zhirinovsky. In fact, a Russian website Medusa even make, made an a test. Uh, people were asked to. Uh, find out uh, uh, does this uh, this or that quote belong to Donald Trump or to Zhirinovsky? And I tried to answer the, this text and I failed. <laughs> uh, well, here's a question: Are, are the uh, are, are the panelists concerned that issues of free expression and censorship in Russia are being used by the U.S. to justify uh, an aggressive American foreign policy? Um, was the uh, was supporting the coup, uh, NATO expansion? Are these considered uh, are these uh, as as part of, of course, the official government uh, of, of Russia thinks that they're provocations? But do you do you think that they're provocations at all? I mean, I guess, it, I guess the, the real question is, do, is, has American foreign policy, is American foreign policy partly to blame in, the, in the Russian aggression? While Anatoly is translating, ah, okay. I think that this question is a very twisted one. No, no, Наверное, его следует понимать так, что Путин определяет американскую политику, что ли? How do we understand this? That Putin determines U.S. foreign policy, American policy? Ah, well, I'll allow me to answer this question in a maybe a bit indirect way. As as far as I understand, you're asking if Putin is kind of a victim to uh, the aggressive policy of the U.S. Uh, if uh, whatever the U.S. are doing in the field of uh, external policy uh, kind of forced Putin to do what he, uh, what he did. And, uh, well, uh, I don't think so. Uh, and uh, I think that our ability and our willingness to, under uh, to understand that 
uh, the other, uh, you know, in, uh, in, in huge letters, sometimes can mislead us because, well, the other, or the other is the other, and we are to do our best to understand him, to support him, to do whatever we can. But sometimes, as the joke goes, the black is black and white is white. And uh, what is going on in Ukraine, in my opinion, is, uh, well, pure and simple evil, as simple as that. Uh, after centuries of totalitarianism, why is the Russian mind still so averse to free expression? I guess we dispute the premise. I, I think we can call it Stockholm Syndrome. <laughs> okay, all right. Um, I, I mean, I think there is the, I mean, to be fair, I mean, I think there is this uh, idea that certain countries are not ready or, or will not be ready for centuries for democracy. And that is something that is uh, definitely part of the, uh, um, the attitude of uh, some Western observers, you might call it. Um, is that something that you would categorically disagree with? Uh, never mind. No, no, let, me, let me just uh, make an admission. Должна признаться, что мне крайне трудно отвечать на эти вопросы, потому что я их просто плохо понимаю. It's it's very difficult for me to understand uh, these questions because I do not understand them uh, very well. In, in Russian or in English, it doesn't matter. Они где-то находятся вне моей логики. Because those questions are outside of my logic. And I have to really make uh, kind of an, um, force myself in a big way to even get to the um, essence of the question. And I do uh, beg your uh, apology. I'm, I'm trying. Wait, this is for you? Um, okay. What do you think? Is it possible to change something in Russia for us, people who live? In this well, that's yeah. What can we do? Я думаю, Маш не может сказать это сама, но а я считаю, что вы все можете дать денег Коль. Don't think that um, Masha can say it uh, yourself, even though okay, you guys, would be foreign agents, but you could give money to Coal to do true. Give money. They're also difficult to read, never mind to understand. Um, uh, do you, well, this is very much to your question. Do you feel that there are parts of this context of uh, Russian dis dissidents that are hard to translate to a, a Western neoliberal context? Of course, yes. Yes, of course, and uh, not only to the Western world, but also to the Russian world, because uh, till the uh, till uh, till the end of their uh, uh, last decade, uh, a newborn generation was raised that doesn't remember the Soviet past, that knows nothing about it, and so. Now, in the times of new challenges and new pressures, it is of vital importance to, to explain everything. And, of course, to write a history of dissident movement. Well, we at Colta, we have this uh, journalistic project. Uh, we are doing series of interviews uh, with the uh, well-known and uh, maybe less known dissidents. Uh, and uh, we are planning to publish a book. Uh, but, uh, of course, it's only a beginning, because uh, this is something to be, uh, to, to be evaluated, uh, and at some point we have to come back for years and years to come. Вот тут как раз у меня есть наступил момент, когда я могу сделать 
Here, um, finally, there is a moment where I could make a remark and a comment. Um, uh, the thing is that we um, live not only uh, in a very acute economic crisis, but we are also living um, in a very uh, important um, um, crisis of mind, crisis of understanding. Because when we use such a word as democracy, and the meaning uh, that different countries and different people put in that and the way they understand this word is different and very different. And uh, moreover, uh, political and economic life of a country sometimes brings it to a very paradoxical point, such as a point where Russia finds itself. Because at first glance, democracy is good. On the other hand, when 86% are saying, great, um, um, crime is ours, and Syria might also be ours. And at that moment, I um, start disliking democracy. Or, and since we do represent here, uh, you know, no matter how we look at it, uh, those 14% that do not say Crimea is ours, we say Crimea is not ours. So we automatically find ourselves in a non-democratic position. Я думаю, что это не только проблема нашей страны, это проблема и вашей страны, и многих других стран сегодня. It's just a problem of our country, it's a problem of your country, it's a problem of many other countries. Потому что за последние, там, скажем, 50 лет изменилось одно, одно чрезвычайно важное обстоятельство. Ну, строго, строго говоря, об этом Орвел писал. And in the past 50 years, uh, there was a change in one very significant circumstance, and to be exact, uh, George Orwell wrote about this. Да, и сегодня можно, перефразируя его, сказать, кто владеет радио, тот владеет радио, телевидением, тот владеет сознанием. And today, paraphrasing, paraphrasing him, we can say that those who own radio and television and mass media they own the mind. And that's a sad situation, uh, but we're living in it and we're trying to overcome it. Um, someone, someone asks if uh, maybe the right thing to do would be to, um, to do what you did and, and, and what, what Ilya did, which was to see what, uh, what happens, to do what you want to and see what happens challenge your inner censorship and, and uh, provoke uh, Putin's government into a direct confrontation and force him uh, into choosing between uh, permission and overt censorship. Is that going to accomplish anything? Is it worth trying? Should more people be braver about trying it? You can. Is it? Is it? Should uh, should there be more acts of provoking censorship, to forcing direct confrontation with the censors? I mean, there isn't. Right. Got it. Um, Ludmila can tackle this. Понимаете, дело в том, что та те четырнадцать процентов, о которых мы уже говорили. You see, the the point is that those fourteen percent that we have spoken about. В отличие от остальных восемьдесят шести, далеко не едины. In contrast to the remaining eighty-six, they are not homogenous. Потому что каждый самостоятельно мыслящий человек имеет свои повороты идей, свои какие-то оттенки мыслей. Because every independently thinking person has their own uh, twists of thought, their own ideas. 
И для людей, которые работают в зоне сопротивления, назовем ее условно так. And for the people who work in this zone of resistance, let's call it that. Есть две категории. Одни, которые считают, что надо работать с правительством, с правительственными чиновниками, пытаться от них чего-то добиваться, заставлять в каких-то случаях острейшие несправедливости. А другие считают, что с нашим правительством, с нашей властью нельзя даже коммуницировать. И тот и другой путь имеет смысл и имеет как бы право на существование. And both ways uh, they um, have a certain sense and they have the right to exist. Есть фонд Чулпан Хаматовой, который спас, наверное, тысячи детских жизней. Uh, there is a foundation of uh, Чулпан Хаматова that uh, might have saved and probably did save thousands of uh, children's lives. Когда были последние выборы Путина, она была его, ну, в общем, принимала участие в его кампании. And uh, when uh, uh, there was uh, uh, an election last time Putin was elected, um, she, uh, this woman, acted uh, as his uh, trusted uh, Um, appointed uh, person. Basically, she participated uh, and advocated for him in the elections. И многие более радикальные люди ее осуждали, говорили, что вот нельзя идти на такой шаг, потому что это ты защищаешь режим очень мало симпатичный. And uh, many uh, people uh, criticized her um, and, and told her that you can't really do this because by Doing that, uh, you are supporting uh, the regime that is far from uh, being a good one. Uh, but uh, I think that three thousand children's lives are worth it, and I would never say anything bad uh, about Chulpan Hamatova. And you understand the position in which we are located? It is constantly put before a moral choice. And you know the situation uh, that we're constantly finding ourselves in, it puts uh, a moral dilemma, puts us in front of a moral dilemma. Власть безусловно аморальна. Uh, the government, the powers uh, to be are of course immoral. Immoral. Там и только отсюда уже следует ее агрессивность, ее безграмотность, ее неталантливость. Uh, управление and, uh, страной. Uh, only from that uh, uh, stems its aggressiveness, its lack of talent uh, in governing the country, its illiteracy. Вот поэтому я бесконечно люблю и ценю моих подруг и моих друзей, которые, тем не менее, разными способами, каждый так, как он может, один дает три рубля, другой идет волонтером в больницу, uh, третий придумывает еще что-то, например, сайт делает. Вот. Uh, и все это люди замечательные, и на самом деле надежда этой страны именно на них, and так мне кажется. That is why I am uh, very grateful and very proud of my friends who do whatever they can. Some of them give three rubles, others go and volunteer in the hospitals, others open a site, and I think this is really where the hope of the country lies. Мне кажется, я понял вопрос несколько не так. Людмила услышал его как должны ли все десять более радикально в рамках выбранных векторов. And um, I maybe um, I understood the question a little bit differently from what uh, uh, how Ludmila responded because uh, it seems to me that you were asking us about whether we should be more radical and try to push the envelope and explore different vectors of activity. В России есть прецеденты более радикальных высказываний, которые имели огромную цену, между тем не имели последствий. In Russia, we have examples of uh, very radical um, um, uh, 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 pronouncements uh, that uh, were left uh, without any consequences, and that left no consequences. Я, конечно, имею в виду Pussy Riot. I, of course, mean Pussy Riot. И тут мы понимаем, что эти действия имеют огромную цену. После этого мы должны сесть в тюрьму и прожить некий определенный 
жизненный опыт приобрести, насильственно приобрести и здесь мы приходим к очень важному для меня вопросу про современный режим то что он отнимает у нас право на индивидуальную радость, индивидуальный путь и индивидуальное внеполитичное счастье. That it strips us of individual joy, individual pleasure and um, 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 individual happiness. То есть, вообще-то я просто хочу заниматься книжками, а не свергать власть. I um, uh, frankly want to uh, uh, make books. I do not want to overthrow governments. А в данных обстоятельствах мы говорим о том, что заниматься культурой — это сопротивляться. About, um, uh, means, uh, uh, и когда вы спрашиваете, можем ли мы быть более радикальны, более настойчивы в наших голосах, то есть вы спрашиваете, почему мы все еще не сидим в тюрьме. And when you're asking if we could be more persistent or more aggressive in our efforts, you're effectively asking where we're not still in prison yet. И между тем это цена, на которую теоретически можно было бы пойти, если бы у этого был смысл. And uh, one perhaps uh, theoretically uh, might be prepared to pay that price if it made um, any sense. Но Pussy Riot уже вышли из тюрьмы, а Путин, Путин все еще сидит в кресле. Pussy Riot uh, have been released from prison, but Putin continues to occupy his chair. Well, uh, I just add a f uh, I'd like to add a few words about exactly Pussy Riot. Um, uh, the thing is, um, uh, I think that contemporary art usually doesn't think about practical sense. Uh, I'm answering you, Ilya. Uh, they were working with uh, the most vulnerable and painful zone of our society and their performance and everything what uh, happened afterwards, well, uh, I think is a great uh, gesture of contemporary art. And uh, well, actually, it's not about the practical sense, uh, but it's about pronouncing some words out loud and um, Uh, well, um, should we all be more radical than we are? I think everybody has his, uh, his own uh, way of fighting and... Когда мы говорим, что мы должны быть более смелыми или более какими-то, это значит, что мы регламентируем остальных людей. When we say that we need to be more uh, or uh, rather braver or more of something, that means that we put a limit on other people. Это я и называю то, что Путин лишил нас права быть самим собой. I am talking uh, about when I say that Putin uh, has uh, stopped us from uh, enjoying a right uh, to be то есть, ourselves. То есть просто читать книжки, uh, просто быть to трусливыми. Just, to just read books, to be cowardly. Uh, uh, то есть просто быть такими, какими хотим мы. To simply be what uh, and how we want to be. Uh, well, I would agree both with Anya and Elia because, of course, Pussy, uh, Pussy Riot and what they did uh, is an absolutely great gesture in the history of modern art. Uh, and what I, I also absolutely agree with uh, uh, with uh, what, he's, uh, what, he, what he's saying when he talks about the state robbing us uh, of free artistical choice. Uh, and uh, I think that the main question here, as in a range of other cases, is who is asking? who is saying we have to be more radical, we have to be more aggressive. If some outer uh, instance, uh, if some outer voice is addressing me and is telling me to be more radical, what can I answer? Go and be more radical. Uh, I think that one has to listen to his inner voice. And uh, it is uh, absolutely of crucial importance in terms of uh, doing art and doing literature. Because, well, when the situation in, uh, in Russia 
uh, evolves as it does in current time, uh, we have some social responsibilities. But these claims are about me as a physical being, not about my artistic decisions. And I still consider important to, to keep uh, the distance between this and this. Well, I, I wish I'd asked that question a uh, half hour ago, but uh, I think we have to be at the end of uh, the talk. Um, I had a um, good time. I hope everyone did. Um, thank you, everybody, for coming.